and um, also plenty of, of dedication when it comes to collaborating with different kinds of partners, also businesses, which take an interest in, in digitalization and, and um, design for different purposes. This project, I think you will uh, introduce to us, is about makerspaces. Yes. So I give the floor to you and you're warmly welcome. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for the kind welcome. Uh, and it's a real honor to be here uh, talking to scholars you know, whose work I draw from uh, in my work, I learned such a lot from the Nordic Network of Scholars, so a uh, real honour to be here. Um, so today I'm going to talk about um, opportunities and challenges in makerspaces in the early years. So I'm focusing on children from birth to eight, because that is my area of speciality. Um, but I also talk with partners in the room who are engaged in this project. Um, uh, which is wonderful. So um, the Makey project, Makey Spaces in the Early Years, is an EU-funded project, and you can see here we've got many partners. Uh, but um, it, you know, as I say, including uh, partners from Norway, uh, Denmark, Iceland, and Finland. Um, and what's nice about this project is it's not only is it interdisciplinary, so it's educationists working with psychologists and sociologists and computer scientists, but it's also intersector. Um, so we're working with librarians, museum educators, and makerspace staff themselves um, in order to draw on their expertise in looking at this particular issue. So we're coming to the end of the project quite sadly. Uh, we've only got a few months left. Um, and so I'm going to really talk about the Sheffield part of the project. Um, but the other country partners here, I'm sure, would be you know, happy to share at the end of the session, perhaps, some things about their own countries as well. So the, the project arises really because of the need to ensure that our youngest children have the skills and knowledge that will enable them to participate in what is known as the fourth industrial revolution the kinds of um, so-called 21st century literacy skills that will be so important, such as problem solving, communication, uh, teamwork, and so on. But also importantly, I think, I think from the youngest age, we need to ensure that our children have opportunities to learn from each other and not to work in disciplinary silos. Um, so that, you know, if we see some of the real challenges that face us across the world, it's about us joining together uh, to try and address these problems collectively across disciplines, across sectors. And so it's engaging young children in, in practices that will enable them uh, to develop the skills that to participate. And the project started because I went into a fab lab, I won't say where, but I went into a fab lab and it looked very much like this. If you don't know what makerspaces or fab labs are, they're spaces that uh, have a range of like digital fabrication tools, they might have woodwork tools and so on. They're open access spaces in city centers normally, which um, allow people to go in and to tinker and to make things. And so I went into this particular lab and I talked to a young man who was making a waterproof case for his iPhone. So really entrepreneurial, fantastic. But it was full of young men, uh, white young men, aged 18 to 24. So very narrow demographic. So I came away and talked to partners in our cost action network uh, about the need to really look at this and uh, make sure that young children, young girls, uh, children from black and Asian minor minority ethnic communities uh, and working class communities, all those demographics we know are the ones least likely to follow um, STEM uh, occupations and, um, and, and education. Also, I think for, there was a challenge for uh, early years practitioners who have often um, found STEM in particular quite a challenge in terms of subject knowledge and confidence. Um, and as I said, young girls who often feel, you know, there's research that shows from the age of six, young girls don't feel that they um, can be scientists. They don't see it and don't aspire to the kinds of um, work that uh, will provide them with the skills and knowledge for the fourth industrial revolution. But it was important because this is early years not to take a STEM approach, but to take a STEAM approach. So with the arts, narrative, storytelling, right in the middle of this kind of practice, because that really builds on early childhood practice anyway, the kinds of thematic understanding that we see so often in early years education. So that was the background, and, and the project really had two aims, which was to look at the value of makerspaces um, for young children and to look at the um, impact on digital literacy skills uh, and creativity. 
And this was our broad definition of maker spaces, which informed the project. So as you can see here, it's very broad, comprised of participants of different ages, levels of experience. Uh, but a commonality is that all these spaces involve making, developing an idea and constructing it. So design very much at the heart of the maker spaces for young children. And I think why we took this broad definition is because in a way, in early childhood practice, they've always been maker spaces. Um, children have always tinkered and so on with a whole range of resources. Uh, of course, you have the tradition in the Nordic countries anyway uh, of woodwork and, and so on being very much still part of the curriculum craft uh, and so on. We've lost that. Uh, in, in the UK, so half of our uh, design, or half of the schools who are delivering design and technology for our GCSE O level at 16 have dropped it uh, in the UK because of the way in which the league tables are constructed. But I think very much in the Nordic countries, you still have design and creativity. So in what in what way is this new? One might ask, uh, and I think it's about the way in which it opens up the kinds of tools and practices that children can engage with. So 3D printers, laser cutters and so on, they have not been tools that early years educators have necessarily uh, had access to. So the maker movement really sort of began in North America, as I say, long tradition in Scandinavia, but in North America around 2005 with this Make magazine, uh, and now they have Make Affairs and so on. Uh, and so in North America, the tradition really has been much more embedded in libraries, museums uh, than uh, in, in Europe. So our project really was to look at what can we take from some of the maker spaces that we have around us? So here we see a textile based maker space, um, a woodwork, uh, a traditional woodwork practice, and then the more modern digital fabrication lab. Um, our maker space project really draws on these three traditions and combines them with early years practice. And so we are looking at maker spaces across these axes. So in both non-formal settings, libraries and museums, and formal settings. Uh, maker spaces that are permanent, um, uh, that are set up permanently in libraries, museums, and schools, or pop-up maker spaces. Um, and the ones I'm going to talk to today about really are the pop-up kind, because many of our schools don't have uh, spaces that will allow them to have permanent maker spaces. <clears throat> and the three key um, foci of the research really is on uh, these terms, hacking, making and tinkering. Hacking is a really interesting term because it was first really emerged with the MIT students in the 1950s um, and was seen very much positively, you know, about taking something, undoing it, redoing it, making something new. It's only in recent years that it has had more negative connotations. And in fact, one of our maker um, uh, artists who works with us in the project, Mark, he was saying that he was in a school and he had a hack space on one of his posters and the head teacher told him to take it down. Didn't like the term hack space. So I think, you know, really sort of shows you that we need to reclaim this word for education. Um, uh, obviously making uh, the core, but also tinkering is important. Not having a product, but the process being important, allowing children time and space to tinker and play, uh, which often in busy curricula gets overlooked um, and we get children get moved on to the next learning objective uh, and so on. I won't go into the research questions of the project. These are on the website, and I'll give you the website URL at the end. Um, but we're looking really at the impact of makerspaces at the individual level. Uh, of the child and the, the practitioners. At the relational level, what happens when groups of children work together in these maker spaces? And then at the institutional level, so what are the factors that enable maker spaces to, to grow in institutions or what closes them down? Um, and it, across the Makey um, projects uh, as a whole, I'll just give you a flavour of some of the other countries. I'm sorry, it's not, uh, I can't quite get the resolution right on here. I hope you can see enough. Um, but in Norway, uh, the team are, uh, sorry, in Denmark, the team are looking at um, playful uses of Lego. And of course, because uh, they've got access to the Lego materials, they're not just sort of tables of Lego, but whole rooms of Lego uh, in which children are collaborating on model making and, and so on in their next practice lab in Aarhus. Um, in Finland, Kristina Kampalainen is leading a team. Um, and of course, in Finland, um, as Annie showed this morning, there's been whole projects, uh, make spaces much more embedded in education than in some of the other countries, which is really interesting, I think, in terms of what can, what can get done in a policy context which furthers that work. 
Uh, in Iceland, um, our colleagues are working with um, eight fab labs, I think now, seven when we started, but a country that has had fab labs and been at the forefront of innovation in technology in this area. Uh, and so we're looking at um, embedding some of that fab lab practice in, in schools and with families. In Norway, uh, the work has been with the National Science Museum, who have generally run maker spaces for older children, but the museum wants to look at under eights. And so they've been working with the kindergarten uh, on that. In Romania, um, they focused on an after-school club because they felt it was too hard to even begin to think about um, working with the school sector because the way in which the curriculum uh, is focused. So they run after-school clubs focused on robotics and coding. And then um, in the UK, um, Sonia Livingston, who's based at the LSE, has been working with colleagues in America, Alicia Blum Ross, and they've been working with three um, museums in the Bay Area, which of course is interesting. The Silicon Valley, they've had maker spaces for many years, very advanced practice in some of their museums. Um, and they've been looking at what, how parents might facilitate uh, young children's me uh, meaning making uh, in maker spaces. Uh, these are the methods that we've drawn upon across the project. So we've observed field notes, photographs, um, interviews with children and practitioners, and uh, children wearing GoPro chess cams, which have enabled us to uh, really get a sense of uh, what the children are doing um, and making. We can really see their embodied nature of meaning making through the GoPro um, cameras. So um, I'm going to talk about Makey in Sheffield um, and look at, first of all, what the opportunities are for developing the characteristics of early learning. And I'm taking this focus um, because in our early years curriculum, um, our early years practitioners are used to thinking about these characteristics of early learning. They're embedded in our early years framework. They'll probably be very familiar and they'll probably be constructed very differently in your countries. But I'm sure you will be familiar with some of the key principles uh, of this area. But before we start, and I'm sorry you won't be able to read this, but it is in papers on our website, and I'll give you the URL. Um, the focus for the uh, Sheffield project has been on thinking about what do we mean about digital literacies in the framework of makerspaces? Uh, can we even begin to conceive of something um, that we might conceptualize as maker literacies? Um, and from this, we've, we've adapted a framework developed by Angela Colvert, who did a PhD on augmented reality games. Uh, and she drew together Bill Green's work uh, and brought it together with sort of Cress's work on design. And I'll explain this. So in Bill Green's work, it's a, an old paper now, 1988. So it's very much about um, traditional print-based literacy practices. But uh, he talked about the way in which there were three domains that children needed to develop competencies and understandings and capacity in. Uh, the first is the operational domain. That's that first column here. Um, so the kinds of skills that will allow children to decode uh, writing, encode writing, um, you know, obviously phoneme, grapheme, relationships and, and so on. So all of the operational skills, children need to communicate. The um, central um, column here is the cultural dimension. So children also need to be able to read the culture around them and speak to that culture. They draw on their cultural resources in their meaning making practices. And the final com column is a critical dimension, those critical skills that children need to become meaning makers. And the three domains interrelate. And what Angela did was to put these against the process of meaning, semiotic meaning making developed by Gunter Kress uh, and Andrew Byrne and others at the Institute of Education in London. So that is really four key processes. The first process is, is design. So as, a child, as children think about the kinds of meaning making and texts and artifacts that they want to share with others, um, the kinds of skills that they need in designing. And then obviously the production stage, the dissemination stage, how do they choose the media and modes that they're going to disseminate their work in. And then finally the interpretation stage. Uh, and that is mapped onto um, Green's three domains. And so why we're adopting this is because it really un unpacks for us the ways in which uh, operational skills can be broadened to not just thinking about a pen and paper, but what happens when children learn to operate some of the, the 3D print, you know, some of the, the um, tools and resources that they might have uh, in the maker spaces themselves. What does it mean when they think about dissemination uh, and they think critically about that dissemination, you know, how to get their text, artifacts, meaning making out uh, to their various audiences and stakeholder groups? 
Um, so that's the sort of framework that, that we're using to think about digital or maker literacies uh, within the, the, the Sheffield project. Um, and so moving on to characteristics of early learning, these are the three areas um, that our government has identified as key for, um, for, for learning. Uh, first is playing and exploring. And again, we've got a lot to learn from Nordic countries uh, in this area. Um, active learning and then creating and thinking critically. So what we've done in our maker project, we really took the creating and thinking critically dimension and we separated it into critical thinking and then creativity and design, which we think, you know, actually we need to focus on both of those quite separately uh, in maker spaces. So if we think about playing and exploring, these are the kinds of prompts uh, that practitioners use uh, as they're looking at young children's learning. So are they using their senses to explore their world? Are they transforming resources? Are they demonstrating that sort of can-do attitude? Are they eager about what they're engaging in? Um, and so what I'm going to show you is for each of the characteristics of early learning, so each of these three, I'll draw from one of the schools um, that engage in our practices, schools and nurseries. So I'm going to look at four um, instances, uh, two in nurseries, and uh, which is uh, children who are aged three and four, and two in schools, so children aged five to seven. Um, and just to show you how the makerspaces in those different instances um, can be mapped onto these areas. Uh, I should say that we had seven, over 74 hours of videos that we've um, coded and analysed. Uh, so it's a big project and we're still working through it. Uh, but I think, you know, certainly in terms of the Sheffield project, we're coming to some conclusions, we feel, around how we might embed makerspaces more broadly uh, in the English practice. And I've separated England from Scotland and Wales because the policy context is very different. Um, so in England, uh, we actually had a, a situation at the moment where the government's put out a consultation document uh, about the early learning goals where they're proposing taking technology out of the early learning goals uh, and also proposing to take shape and space out of the mathematics early learning goals in uh, an effort to focus uh, on the narrow um, skills of, of maths and phonics. Um, at the same time, we have a uh, Minister of Education who's very keen on the home learning environment. So I'm actually chairing a government panel where we're looking at apps and how we might develop criteria for parents to use apps. So it's an interesting time. And uh, I think over the next few months, it will be really important to share some of the work that we're doing in nurseries around the value of technology uh, in early years practice. Um, so this is why the makerspace work is very important for us uh, in order to have early years um, practitioners see the value of using technology as one of their tools, not the only. Um, so that's playing and exploring. So I'll share with you Broomhall Nursery. Um, so the project aim aims here were to develop digital literacy and creativity through projects related to light and colour. And they particularly focused on children uh, understanding the principles of a simple circuit, which in our curriculum is year three, which is, you know, children are aged eight and nine, uh, not three and four year olds. Um, but nevertheless, the, 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 the team felt that the children would be able to understand this if it was done in ways which were uh, child-centred um, and based on early years principles. So we began where they made light boxes. Um, you can see here them creating some of the circuits, putting them inside boxes with cellophane. We then um, created light shows using the Pablo app and printed them off with a HP sprocket printer. So the children actually wore their little um, slideshows their, 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 um, the, from Pablo. They were able to wear their outcomes of that, that work, which they absolutely loved. Talk about embodied learning. That was probably the, the most favorite activity that uh, the children did during that time. They, um, many of you probably are very familiar with squishy circuits where children through Play-Doh, which is conductive, uh, then use circuits to light their models up. Uh, and of course, this is nice because it's based on familiar early years materials uh, and approaches. Um, and then we drew with circuits. So using copper tape um, and some of the LEDs, the children did collaborative drawings. So here you can see some boys here uh, developing a collaborative drawing. And I think that was a train track they did with uh, trains that lit up 
uh, alongside that. And that was nice because it did um, lead to lots of collaborative work on large sort of sheets of paper. She was able to do, to do that um, together. Uh, we also did lots of light work, making animations using the interactive whiteboard. Um, so you can't see the photograph, but we had a, they, they used their light boxes in a Santa's grotto. It was just before Christmas. Um, so, you know, real purposes for the, for the use of their products uh, and outcomes. And very simple kind of animations that the children made with their own soundtracks. Uh, we made torches um, and children then took them into a blackout tent and here you'll see, I hope you can hear the children then singing nursery rhymes as they played with their torches. Uh, so as young children do, they embed uh, their learning, you know, in lots of different ways, express that multimodally through song, um, through mark making and so on. So we saw lots of that, children taking the things that they've made in the make a pop-up workshop and taking that into other areas of learning throughout, throughout the nursery. Um, this is the Pablo app, so it's a free downloadable app on a smartphone and then the children made these light shows in, a, in, in the tent um, uh, with their torches. And the nursery then turned these into calendars that they sent home. We have a tradition where we send home calendars uh, at Christmas um, and so the children made these as their, uh, as their calendars. Uh, and wrote their names and Christmas messages and so on. So uh, this is just to really demonstrate that there is no demarcation between old and new um, literacy practices. They merge into one another and children move flu fluidly across them in these kinds of maker spaces. And there is no intention uh, to separate them out into any artificial way. We see that it's very much meaning making with whatever tools we really sort of focused on, on Gunter Cress's notion of children will use whatever tools are to hand for their meaning making processes. And I, I think our job really is to get them to think critically about which tools might be best for which particular context and circumstance um, so that they are critical about the modes and media that they, that they use. Um, and in terms of thinking about this playing and exploring, I want to focus on Henry. So um, he came into the final day of the makerspace and said, what are we making today? And had really sort of, you know, developed into this maker by the end of the project. Um, and I'll read them just in case it's not quite clear. Uh, but the teacher said that, you know, Henry was quite shy and we'd made a referral for him to speech because he wasn't really speaking very much. He was learning four languages. Uh, and so we were kind of thinking to ourselves, do we need any intervention for this little man? I think the nursery was a little bit anxious that this is one intervention too many, you know, too many projects. Maybe he didn't need that. But then they said the Makey project just captures his imagination. He made his little sticker um, and he, he wanted to show the staff what they'd done. And then when it was group time, where the children all sat together, he showed the other children and he stood up and he told them about his light box and the traffic lights. And the, the practitioner said, so all this language suddenly came bursting out of Henry um, that we kind of not really heard before. And then when his mum came at the end of the day, she was just so excited uh, to show her his light box. And he went into the sensory room, which is a dark room where children can play with light and sound and shapes and textures. And he turned all the lights off and he showed her. And then she downloaded the Pablo app on her phone. And then she said he actually talked to his grandfather in Lithuania on Skype. Uh, and they had this discussion about um, circuits and things. So actually really helped this child's confidence. And she really couldn't describe his words quick enough of all that Henry was telling us. So here's Henry, just to give you an example of his language. And now I'll turn it on. That's his mum.
Okay, so I don't have time to play it all, but I think you get the idea of how engaged he was. And the, the nice thing was there that mum was able to take that up home and so extend the learning uh, with him at home. So not an isolated incident in terms of playing and exploring and engagement um, in the nursery activities. And then thinking about the second um, of the categories um, that we're looking at in terms of characteristics of early learning, active learning. So um, questions that the practitioners are asked to think about are, are the times when children are absorbed in their own learnings and do they demonstrate persistence? Persistence and resilience, I think, are two characteristics that are really important for young children to learn. So they can go back to things when things fail, uh, they can set their own goals uh, and so on. So, you know, active learning absolutely key, I think, to how makerspaces operate. And so at Montini Nursery, again with three and four year olds, it's just before Christmas, so they also wanted to do light uh, and understand a simple circuit. Uh, but they also wanted to celebrate the community. So this is a, a community that's in an area of north of Sheffield and often gets bad press in the local media because of gangs, um, uh, you know, violence and so on. And so the teacher wanted the children to actually celebrate the community. Uh, so she asked the children to make houses at home with their parents. Uh, and they then, um, she wanted them to create uh, a lamp post, uh, a light inside the house and a lamp post ne next to their house, and then Christmas trees. So you can see here what they've done is they um, created Christmas trees through cutting out shapes that they were then laser cut by our local maker. So this is a collaborative project with our local maker. So we couldn't bring a laser cutter into the nursery, but the children were explained the process. So each of the, the, the trees were individual and then the children used the copper tape uh, and little clips, because crocodile clips are a bit hard for three-year-olds, uh, and leads to make twinkling um, Christmas trees as part of the project. So I'm just going to show you a short video which gives you an overview of this project. And then green screen films, where um, they were filmed singing and dancing in front of their Christmas forests, which obviously the parents uh, loved um, the outcomes of those. Um, and you can see here, this became a sort of what I call a boundary object, because when we first started this project, the maker had said, well, I can bring in some model laser kits of houses and the children can make their houses. And I said to him, no, James, you know, the idea is that the children create their own. Although, as you can see, it's probably the parents had done most of those houses. Um, uh, and then he, he'd gone to the nursery teacher and said, oh, but I'll make these kits. And she said, no, we don't have 30 Easter baskets all the same like we used to. Uh, but actually then what he did was create the kits for the um, lampposts but that actually provided a very strong structure for the children then to learn how to create that circuit because they just had to stick the copper tape on and so on. So for him it was a boundary object, it let his expertise be brought into the uh, kindergarten and the nursery uh, and it also taught me something about how you know we need to perhaps compromise when we work with externals to education um, because you know in the end it, it did work really really well. Um, and with the laser cutting, it did allow the Christmas trees all to be quite different uh, in how they looked. And so in thinking about active learning, the maker, James, talked about Carl, who was, he was initially involved um, with the technologies, he was able to wire it up. But when it came to his Christmas tree, and that was the most complex because of the twinkling lights and multiple lights, 
there was something not quite right with the circuit that he'd made and he'd become fr frustrated. So James gave him the, just the, ba the battery pack and the lead, nothing else, and let him play with it so he knew how to test it. And then he s could see him suddenly get it. He went, oh. Um, and then he was actually putting the things together um, and uh, the moment he actually got the testing he, he saw that not only did he then about 45 seconds later complete his Christmas tree but he then went on to immediately helping other children uh, and he also ended up helping some of the practitioners. So I think you can see there that resilience and persistence going back and trying to solve problems. Again Carl is just one example of how that happened uh, in that nursery. In terms of critical thinking, so as I told you, we, d we separated out critical thinking and design and creativity. In terms of critical thinking, the prompt questions were, do they have their own ideas and use their initiatives? Do they demonstrate curiosity, imagination, innovation? Um, how do they solve problems or challenges in their designs? Um, and are they trying something different rather than following what someone else has done? So the school that I'm going to draw on here was Norfolk Community School um, and they wanted to explore play spaces in the local community. Again, a little bit like Parson Cross, it's an area of low socioeconomic status in Sheffield. A lot of the play spaces have been um, really neglected over the years and so on. Um, and again, they wanted the children to think about their play spaces, but then to imagine differently. How might they imagine different kinds of play spaces? And so Bobby Nisha and, and Bryony Olney, two researchers in the project, went in um, with the aim of enabling the children to think about this through taking the physical into the digital. So they wanted the children to create their play spaces um, physically through collage, but then they also wanted to work with virtual reality and how might they take some of the concrete stuff from um, their constructions into the virtual world. And they did this through using an app called Clone, Qlone, uh, and you'll see here how the children took one mode um, into the other, the physical into the uh, virtual. So here they're creating collages of their play spaces using 3D pens. Uh, they went out into the playground to take photographs of where they played as a stimulus for their collages. So you can see very traditional art practices in the school. But those integrated with some of the newer technologies like 3D pens. And then they use clones, so they made clay models of creatures or playthings. Uh, clone then scans it and makes it into a 3D digital model. And you can then use augmented reality. You can make that pop up in the classroom if you wish to. You can see it there on the carpet now, the model, which the children loved having it in the classroom here. And then they took that into tilt brush and created a virtual world uh, around it. So what some people are calling fidgetal, <laughs> uh, fidgetal, which is a, a mixture of the physical and the digital. Um, and we began this because Dylan Yumar de Rice, who also is one of the researchers on the project, she'd done some early work on virtual reality. And she said that what really helped the young children was being able to take something concrete from the physical world into the virtual world because it's a very new environment for them. Uh, and in some senses then, again, that was a boundary object, you know, allows them to see that physicality uh, within the virtual environment. So that's why we drew on that in this project. And, and that, it did work really, really well. And I, I took it into the next project, as you can see. So the last um, of the four areas, we, we got the, the three areas into four, is creativity and design. And we were really interested in this one about um, thinking about whether they're using materials in creative ways. Um, how did they use materials? Um, and could they make suggestions as to how their artifacts and so on could be improved?
And so this was in Clifford School, um, and our project uh, aim was to develop children's enjoyment in the Moomin stories uh, and to foster their creativity uh, across both digital and non-digital domains again. Uh, we had a, a Finnish parent in the school. Um, who was an expert in the Moomin stories, but we also started with uh, this wonderful puppet show um, which enthralled the children and introduced them to the Moomins. Um, and of course, I don't need to, you'll be very, very familiar with the, with the Moomin books, which the children loved. Um, and here's Minna, the Finnish um, parent, and we set up, um, thanks to um, actually Heidi and, and Christina's team, we set up a link to um, a school in Hels Helsinki, wasn't it, uh, in which the children had a chance to find out about Helsinki uh, and to develop a broader context, cultural context for learning about the Moomin stories. Um, I, I won't play the, 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 the inter exchange uh, because we actually don't have permission um, for the finish end which is here on the uh, on the phone uh, but it was a very interesting exchange and I think we rather shocked the Finnish children um, because our children have uniforms and they have long school days uh, and the Finnish children were talking about being near the beach and not having uniforms and so on so it was a very interesting cultural exchange I think for the children um, the children then drew these little Moomin characters uh, and again James cut them out on his laser cutter. He did say that it took him such a long time to get, but I think the representations of what the children did uh, were absolutely great. I mean, our only, it's a shame, really, I think in another project I might try and get a portable laser cutter so the children can actually see the process because it's a bit frustrating when they see um, something as a finished product that was initially designed and they can't see um, what happens in between. Similar to 3D printing if you don't have the 3D printer there. Um, we then created these little shoebox theatres where they had their Moomin characters. And you can see, again, uh, thinking about um, circuits behind, they created these backdrops uh, with lights. Um, so, uh, again, a nice integration of different kinds of meaning making um, in, in there. They, again, going back to traditional literacy practices, so they did lots of writing. They uh, wrote play scripts for their little shoebox theatres. Um, which they then performed in uh, uh, an assembly. And so the, this is from a parent. The parent was tweeting lovely scenes. My kids have had an amazing time uh, with the project and so on. Um, we did clay models of the Moomins um, and then using the clone app again. So the clone app allows you to export to virtual reality, but you can also export to an STL file, uh, which means you can 3D print it. Now, and this was uh, interesting. Uh, you remember that I said that in this category, we wanted children really to explore materials. And so that was really interesting because we made uh, these little animated films where they, um, oops, sorry, that was the Moomin, I'm not sure I can play that, but that's the Moomins uh, going to the beach. <laughs> um, and you can see the mermaid and so on. Uh, and as they were making it, you know, ears were falling off the clay models. Uh, the children were getting a little bit frustrated as they do with uh, clay models in animation. We all know that with young children. But they were saying, oh, the 3D printed model, obviously much more robust and so on. So really interesting to think about the properties uh, of those um, t two characters. Uh, they then remixed um, Moomins, they wrote uh, alternative events to the Moomin stories and so on. So lots of traditional practices there. And then we borrowed um, Bryony and, and Bobby's notions of taking this into um, a virtual world. So the Moomins actually then, you know, were embedded in a virtual world and they, they did a, a virtual Moomin Valley around it. And it was really interesting. First time really I've worked with virtual reality with young children. And you know, for adults, we're not quite sure as you go into that mode and it's a bit uncertain. Our children are just very, very confident uh, about 3D design. So designing right around, you can see bending down, um, reaching out, and no inhibitions for, from any of the children uh, in, in that. Um, and here's just a little example. Obviously I can only show you in 2D, not 3D but some of the Moomin Valley worlds that they did. So you can imagine that in 3D all around you. 
I'll turn the music down as I talk. And um, I have to say that this, you know, was the most successful of all of our uh, projects. I mean, the children just, they, it was magical to them that they could build this world around there. There's their moomin in the middle. Uh, and children were saying things like, this is their best thing in my life. And, uh, <laughs> um, uh, so, you know, we, we could hardly get them away from it. In terms of health and safety, people often ask about health and safety with VR. We were careful not to let the children use it for any more than 10 minutes at a time. Of course, there are no guidelines. The manufacturer's guidelines are for children aged 13 and over often. But, um, you know, we heard from the industry that that's just based on the fact that they made it up. They said there's no research in this area. Let's just put that age on. Uh, but actually, virtual reality now is used pretty much um, extensively in primary. But we were very careful with such young children, you know, 10 minutes. Uh, there were a couple of the children who did feel a little dizzy um, afterwards, and so they sat down. We made sure that, um, you know, that we, they had an opportunity to sit down. And I understand that. I myself get very um, s physically sick if I'm in these kinds of worlds. Uh, you know, there's IMAX theatres. I think there must just be some of us who can't manage this kind of environment. Uh, so we took that into account, but um, very successful. Um, and so what we did was we decided to construct um, an observational framework in which we took each of those characteristics. Uh, we called the first one playing and exploring engagement, active learning motivation, critical thinking and creativity and design. And then we added to it, because what we felt was missing uh, was social aspects, social learning. So ask practitioners to think about how these activities enable them to listen to the idea of others and build on the Id ideas of others, collaborating with other children and so on. That's a very important part of the makerspace experience and was missing um, in terms of thinking about those characteristics of early learning. Um, and we took that assessment format into our community-based makerspaces, um, which I think, Yeni, you came along to, to those uh, makerspaces and grew, I think, also, she here. Um, yes, yeah, so you came along, didn't you, to those makerspace events. So this was for our local community. Um, so many immigrant asylum-seeking um, families um, in the local area uh, to the university. And we ran a six-month after-school um, makerspace, very different to the school projects. So the school projects, because the, per because the f teachers wanted particular outcomes, as you can see, quite product focused, although the children did have opportunities to tinker. So in the nurseries, they had outside areas where the children could play uh, and tinker in the outdoor areas. But with the Broomhall Community Centre project, we were able to let children just play and tinker, but also construct. So here, they're constructing a, a marble, marble run. Um, and, and also what was quite different is we never knew how many children would turn up. Uh, it was very difficult to anticipate. So we could, you know, at one point we had 36, I think, in one evening, uh, others much less. So it was a very, very, very different experience. But that looking at the characteristics of early learning and adding the social, I won't read this, but enabled us to do some quite detailed um, observations of children's learning. So they're very detailed observation of uh, what children were doing as they were making a marble run. So in terms of assessing the characteristics of early learning, we've taken that now in our latest project. Teachers are using that observation framework uh, and they're finding it really useful. Um, and they said in such a short period of time, we've got quality observations and we've ticked off so many descriptors, it was crazy, which I think tells you something of the uh, context in which our practitioners are working, that they've got to, when Ofsted come, show that they are demonstrating those characteristics of early learning. Uh, and obviously this project is allowing them to do that uh, in, in so many ways. So it's very rich and I think one of the... Um, things that we want to move on to now is think about that assessment tool and and look at our video data in relation to was it particular types of activities that promoted particular characteristics of early learning um, and then how can each of those characteristics be supported in makerspaces um, you know we want to go back to the data to do some really digging into the kinds of practices that might support active learning or critical thinking and so on uh, and then how can children be involved in documenting and reflecting on their own learning? Um, and also, I think, in relation to the Broomhall Community Centre Makerspace, which we want to run again, it's um, documenting that learning in the makerspace, but then giving that information to the teachers who may not understand what children are doing outside of school or be familiar uh, with the kinds of practices.
So in thinking about, um, so really, I, you know, we see the, the, that assessment tool as one of our opportunities, our opportunity for demonstrating <coughs> that maker spaces do have a huge place in developing the kinds of learning that we've seen, especially in a context where often our focus is on subject knowledge. Uh, and what we want to say in, in looking at the characters of early learning is it's more about the kinds of skills and expansive 21st century um, uh, competences that children develop than it is about the, the subject knowledge, although of course it's important. And it's great that our three and four year olds now know how to do make a circuit because then when they move on to the, you know, that, that cr science curriculum, they're much more familiar and engaged and they have that confidence. So that is a great opportunity. But there are challenges for developing characteristics of early learning. Uh, in our survey, we did a survey across the countries involved in the Makey project, and these came up as the key challenges for practitioners, and there are probably no, you know, no surprises there. That's very similar to the kinds of challenges we see for any kind of digital projects. Um, and so in the Make projects that you've seen, we felt we'd addressed a lot of this. We'd addressed its subject knowledge. Uh, we actually, I should have said, that prior to the maker workshops, we had the practitioners come in and play before the children had had chance. So they didn't feel exposed themselves, um, perhaps, you know, and, and, and that conf lack of confidence not being demonstrable, demonstrable to, the, to the children. So we felt we'd, apart from time, which we can't really uh, do much about, but we'd address much of this. We had a pop-up makerspace. It was literally an IKEA trolley uh, that we took in with all of the materials and so on. But our projects, you see, hugely successful, but not embedded in um, everyday practice. It was a key challenge for us. The, the teachers all said, it's been fantastic. We've loved you coming in and doing this with us, but we haven't got the time. So we wanted to think about what we needed to do. So we thought, talk um, Bourdieu's notion of capital, which Edgerton and Roberts talk about, you know, includes adaptive cultural and social competences such as familiarity with institutional context, processes and experience, possession of relevant intellectual and social skills. So that, cap that capital that we all develop through our cultural experiences, we thought about that in relation to the maker spaces themselves. And how were we helping people to develop capital? And of course, the practitioners themselves recognised it when it came to the children. So one of the teachers said, there's literally about five out of this class of 24 and I, they, I can tell they've either got dads or mums that have tinkered and literally dads that are usually engineers. Uh, this was in the Clifford School, the more middle class of the schools. Um, and oh, my dad let me put the batteries in and my dad's done this. And my dad works with electricity and he's got lots of things in his garage that he shows me. And you can tell because he's about the only one who could put the batteries in the right way around. Uh, so make a capital really of children and what's interesting in the Makerspace projects is it lets those children who might not have the other kinds of cultural capital that align to the middle class practices often, it's particular storybooks that are used in schools and so on, and particular ways of reading and writing that are recognised in the school system. But Makerspaces lets children with what we might see as maker capital, tinkering with often dads in garages, they're the ones who might shine uh, in these kinds of activities and it allows that you know, broader recognition. But we also thought, well, Maker Capital actually also, um, you know, it, if we, we can apply it to, to the teachers. And so one of the things that we did through the Maker Capital was these workshops for teachers where they had time to tinker and play. And that's really important, I think, if we think about teacher education. So we've got a student-run uh, makerspace in Sheffield, the iForge, that our engineering students have um, developed, and we hope our education students will have opportunities to go and learn and develop. But also habitus is important. So uh, Bourdieu's notion of habitus, these structures of perception, conception and action, the way we think and our bodily habitus that we develop over time that frames our future activities, frames and shapes them. Uh, it, you know, it doesn't structure them in the sense that we have no agency, I don't think, and Bourdieu never meant that, uh, but it certainly shapes them uh, inevitably. Um, and he, um, he talks about the logic of practice. This was actually in his book, Distinction, this, this. He talks about the way, if we think about habitus times capital, and the way they operate, so our habits uh, and frames that we develop, 
our cultural capital and maker capital that we develop over time and the field in which it's applied, which in this case is the education field, the, the classroom, equals practice. Oop, equals practice. So in th thinking about the teachers, we wanted to think about how do we move habitus? We've got maker cap capital. What can we do to think about habits and habitus and frames? So we took a very traditional practice in uh, early years, which is story sacks. I don't know if you have them in the Nordic tradition, but in England we have a picture book with puppets, language game, maths game, and the idea is that the children then develop their knowledge and competence in relation to this picture book, and that gives them the confidence to rehearse their language and skills across the subjects. So we took that and made makey boxes. Very simple concept. So there's the picture book um, with the language game. We added small world play. So this one was on toys, and we had toy story play or something like that. Puppets are artifacts related to the book. Uh, but then maker activities, just a couple of maker activities. In this case, it was making a marble run and then the squishy circuits that you saw earlier. We developed um, these kinds of um, leaflets for the teachers. So this one is a makey box in the woods uh, and it has the story sacks in. It's a small world play with the plastic animals and so on. Language games, deep dark wood game, tree house game. And these were the maker activities. So we gave them twigs and string and children making bird fairy houses. And then we gave them woodwork tools and wooden blocks to make a bird house. So we thought maybe this is because this builds on habitus. It builds on that knowledge. Um, maybe this is one way of developing practice. And we made about 20 of these maker boxes. You can see all the different themes we chose that we knew early years practitioners would be having, like mini beasts, fantasy, on the farm, uh, superheroes and so on. And we have put these on the maker, Makey website if you're interested. So the brochures for, for teachers, you can download and see what, they, what we put in the boxes. <coughs> And I have to say, it's, we just, we're doing it with 31 um, nurseries and, and early year settings. And so we're just in the middle of our data uh, analysis and collections. This is the first set of teachers. Um, and it's really, I think, changing practice in the way that our first set of projects didn't. So the teacher says, it's going really well. I mean, so we, we, you know, they came to the university. We introduced them to the boxes. They had a play. We gave them each a a picture book and some tools and said we want you to come back and think about your own maker box how would you take this picture book and what would you do so that they were they were embedding that knowledge in thinking through their own um, and she said it's obviously the maker boxes they're brilliant because we use those in early years all the time you know like the story sack theme we've always used those and then a second teacher has your understanding of maker spaces changed or is it not changed? And I think it's changed quite a lot, she said. Um, having a work, we used to think, oh, having a workbench might be risky, but actually doing the making project, um, I've currently got a workshop, which is part of my continuous provision. So children access tools whenever they want to. Uh, and many of the um, settings now have set up tinker spaces in a way which we wanted with the first set of projects, but we never got. Um, so I think, you know, in terms of, you know, concluding, I'll come back actually to that. Um, but in thinking about these characteristics of early learning, it's emphasizing to our practitioners that these are really embedded in the makerspace practice. But it's also taking account not just of the maker capital, but as I say, habitus. And that really is allowing us, I think, to shift practice. It'll be interesting to see how, you know, whether it's longitudinal, but already it feels as though it might be, because they're saying, oh, well, we're taking this box and we're showing our year one teachers it. Uh, and, you know, so it's actually beginning to be extended beyond the early years um, settings. And going back to the culvert model that we used in terms of maker <laughs> literacies, we're finding that. Um, What's really interesting about this is that the way in which the maker spaces are run is really important to whether these three domains are each give an equal weight and equal time, and particularly the critical dimension needs intervention. The children obviously are making critical decisions all the time about what kinds of materials and so on, uh, but it's about thinking about dissemination and interpretation. You need those times to bring the children together to look at what they've been doing, to reflect on it, to talk. Unless we have that kind of intervention, uh, we're seeing less uh, obvious 
um, elements of, of you know dissemination crit in terms of this critical dimension so that that was really interesting and has meant has led us to really sort of focus on the winding up and the wrapping up of the makerspace session in relation to those opportunities so um, I think the implications of this really are for research we need to extend the project to think about how that CPD model can be extended so we're also looking now I think we can do this with story boxes maybe we can do it with junk modeling or loose parts play so these are practices that the early years practitioners are well uh, established in and let's use that as a starting point for the maker spaces and that might move confidence and so on I think for policy, we really need to look at um, attitudes and dispositions. So we've got, you know, TPAC, uh, uh, I'm sure you're familiar with that, this notion of we need content knowledge and pedagogical knowledge uh, of teachers to, to be developed before they feel confident. But we also need those attitudes, don't we, and dispositions uh, to change before we can really move practice on. And then practice we do need more emphasis on uh, characteristics of effective learning rather than cramming children with subject knowledge. Uh, more likely to you know, prepare them for the kinds of skills I talked about right at the beginning um, uh, you know, through this STEAM approach. So if you're interested in the website, as I say, uh, if you look on the resources section, it's got the link to um, the, the, the makey boxes. But, but I'll stop there because you know, I've got colleagues in the room who've also done lots of really interesting work on makerspaces who may want to you know, contribute some of their thoughts on how we might change uh, teachers' practice in this area. And thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.